Welcome to the Life Writing Podcast, where married authors and screenwriters Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve do talk about writing during stressful times, breaking into Hollywood, and balancing life. Every week, we're sharing more tips on how to build a better life while you create your dream projects. Even if it's only at the rate of one sentence a day, Life Writing is the application of the tools of writing to life and the tools of life to your writing. Hey, so here yeah. we are. Hi, darling. Hi there. You're all made up. What were you up to today? I'm all dolled up. You can't see it if you're just listening to the podcast, but I have professional makeup today because I was off shooting, uh, let's just say some segments of a, a documentary that will be appearing on Shudder. I don't know that I'm at liberty to say what it's about, but I will say it's about horror. <laughs> And I was just there and I took some selfies with like a, a replica of Jason and a replica of the alien. And we ran into, I ran into a former podcast guest, Rodney Barnes. Oh, that's very cool. It's very cool. Yeah. He was in there recording when I uh, showed up. So that was cool. You just should have been there. We'll make sure yeah, you're I should have, You know, and sometimes I do these things and sometimes I don't. Yeah. Sometimes but you do. What you got, let's, you know, just talking a, a little bit about what's going on in our lives right now is I think a good a good way to get into this question of organization and and flow and ultimately writer's block. So this is just us today. Everybody yeah, needs to just know. Just us today. No, we, we are the guests today. We are the guests. So um, hooray. So what, what's going on in your, you know, the, it, what are you working on? Then I'll talk about what I'm working on. Then we can talk about what we're working on. Then we talk about what we're waiting for. You know, and it's just, it's on and on and on. And what's already done, there's just so much going on. So what, you know, just start with you, hon. Okay, well, I'll give myself a little bit of, of a glissando as I talk about what I'm working on, like I'm a magical sprite. Well, I am going to publish a short story collection next year. It's my first book since 2015. And my, oh, well, actually that's not true because I have a graphic novel coming out in the fall, but it's my first short story collection since 2015. And I have to write three new short stories, which might not sound like a big deal to those of you who are listening, but yeah, I, I was not coming up with a whole lot of ideas. So this weekend I was very excited that an idea I had based on, uh, quite frankly, finding some weird looking fungus in our shower, not to get too ah, deep. Ah, you it's, are doing that one. Good. I'm finally doing my fungus in the shower story and uh, asking myself what it is, what it means, and getting access to a character. Because, you know, the premise is one thing, but like, who's the character? Who's the character who's going to That's be living? That's access story primarily, isn't it? It is, except the fungus came first this time. Let me ask you a question. Do you create a character before you know anything about the story and then sometimes say, well, what would be the, you know, how do you go from character to story if you don't know anything about the story? Very infrequently would I go from a character if I have no idea of what the story is. So maybe in truth, a lot of these ideas do come kind of premise first, you know, like I wrote a short story. Wow, I've been writing a lot of short stories for editors who ask me for stories. So I'm at the point now where I can't even remember the name of this story. I like it a lot though. And I wanted it to be a historical meeting the 1970s horror with a creature told through the eyes of a little boy. So I had like the barest whisper that there's going to be a little boy narrator, basically uh, pr protagonist for the story, but I didn't know that much about him. It, it really is with short stories. A lot of it is a discovery process. And what I was discovering trying to write this fungus story is that the woman I decided would be the best person to interact with this fungus and sort of get on this journey. I did not like her. Woo, I did not like her. I couldn't relate to her. So I had to kind of find myself in her. I had to soften her up. I had to, to really make her more empathetic just to me so I could e even keep going with the story. So, you know, I would look at it like if you start with a premise, a story world, a situation, you ask yourself through whose eyes would this situation be best experienced and you know the character who's witnessing you know might be also the person who can resolve the situation in which case they have the potential to be the, the the hero of the story the protagonist and you could also go the other way around if you start with a really interesting character i'd ask well what is it that would empty this character out so that we get to, we get to know everything that we need to know about this character it's going to require a very special situation 
So I'm not going to say more yet. I, it's it's still a baby, and uh, I'm so excited that it, it's taking its first bottle and it's actually starting to move around a little bit. But this is a character, you know, my philosophy, if you listen to this podcast and I talk about horror, I talk about the two gateways to horror, which are trauma, like grief and hereditary or in midsummer, or transgression, right? And in this case, I wanted to create a character who had committed a transgression and guilt is driving her through the story. And guilt is the real horror from life. And everything else that's supernatural is just sort of to, to dress that up and, and make that point about the devastating impact of guilt. Have you ever done a story where a group of people were guilty of something and therefore experienced the horror together? No, I don't think so. Huh, not, okay. not yet, but hey, my life is young or yeah, not as yeah, young as it could yeah, be, yeah, but yeah, it's absolutely. Long. So that's what you're working on. And anything, are you working on anything else? Well, that's what I'm working yeah. on. And what I wasn't working on <laughs> This ah. weekend, because I decided I wanted to work I mean, like on something. In the last week, since 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 the last time we spoke to our fun, book. is a pitch. You all know how much I love working on pitches. My fingers are crossed as I say that. So I've been circling around uh, a pitch. I'm not going to say what it is, but I've been circling around a pitch for some time. And it is a bit difficult to work on because, you know, sometimes my collaborator and I are not seeing eye to eye. And when I get in that situation, I hear my collaborator's voice in my head as I'm working instead of my own voice. And I start to falter a little bit because I'm like, well, wait, whose voice am I listening to? Can I combine the voices? And it's just not as much fun as say writing like a new short story. So this weekend I, I could have been working on that pitch but I, I mysteriously ended up making inroads on my short story instead. I guess that's one thing you could do. I mean, the the avoidance pattern that often creeps up. If you avoid working on one project by working on another project, then at least you're still producing material and moving forward. And, so and I will say this, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, honey, no, but well, like I told you this morning, I, I said I needed to work on something generative. And, and what I meant by that was I needed something that would feed me instead of me having to feed it right a pitch is like was sort of coming at you yeah you're way up a pitch is like you're way up in the air trying to figure out like what are the storytelling elements that you need to convey this to people verbally really is what you're working on or on paper and it's not the meat and bones of a story it's like the whisper of a character but it's not the character it's like a set of events but it's not going to be all the events because in the writing process as things open up and images open up, you just, you, you think of more in a, in a kind of a longer treatment. So to me, writing a pitch is more like a school assignment. It doesn't wake up the part of me, you know, that we part of me as much as I would like it to. And that's, and I, I do want to work on that. I would love to feel excited about pitches, but in this one, it's just a little challenging. So I, I, I went to a short story and that's the part of me that's just writing for fun. Right. Right. Let's see. How about you? Well, there's a sense of there. We're waiting to see a couple of studios, you know, competing with each other to get one of our projects. Yay! So when that happens, it's really great. It's like Godzilla. It's, you sit back and say, "Let them fight." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No matter who, no matter who wins, we win. Right. Um, and so that's nice. But there was also a pitch last week oh where, you put your foot see you put your foot in that pitch well it was kind of fun i mean they basically some a group of people showed us a graphic novel and asked us to uh come up with a pitch for a podcast to be sold to audible and i took a look at the numbers involved it scripted that, podcasts by the way scripted, scripted narrative scripted podcast dramatic narrative yeah. podcast, very similar to old time radio you know, which I love. I've listened to thousands of hours of old time radio. I just love that stuff. You know, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is, is my all time favorite, a detective dramatic show. And so I would love to do something like that. And when I found out, like I said, that the numbers were good, that there really is good money in there, I was inspired to create a, a, a pitch. And my way of, of creating a pitch is to just write down whatever is in my mind and then polish it later. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten, you know, the, you have to, in order to do that, you have to be willing to tell the voices in your head to shut up. It's not good enough yet, but it's almost like there's one phase 
where the ideas are behind your eyes and you can't evaluate them. And then there's another phase where the writer is on the 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 story is on the page. You put the ideas that you know on the page. Now they're in front of your eyes, and it's almost as if there's a different form of evaluation that can go on at that point. I can see things, you know, and and I keep I I was able to to put together, you know, I asked them. Actually, yeah, what I did was I asked them to give me a copy of the best pitch they had, something that had sold a show for them. And what I did was I they gave me a PDF, and I translated the PDF to Microsoft Word or actually Google Doc. Word, yeah, Google Doc. And then I went through and I replaced everything. In other words, like, well, here they're talking about the people. So I put in what I knew about people. The here world. Here about the story, the world, the background, the research, the this, that, this, that. So I replaced everything. Then I went through it and, and, and took out everything that had been there originally. So I, I had, I used their structure to put in what I knew about the story. And by taking a look at the way the guy that had done that, that pitch had put it together, where they had pictures, where they had these thoughts, that thoughts. I was able to sort of see the relationship between the parts, and that's another thing that triggers creativity. It's If you come up with a person, then you might ask yourself, what kind of friends and business associates and so forth does that person have? What kind of hobbies do they have? You, you, you flesh it out by putting in what you know and then looking at the parts of what you know that trigger other thoughts. And if they're coming from the right kind of creative space, eventually they'll begin to coalesce. The shape of something will begin to emerge. And you'll always hit, you'll always hit a dead end that day. But if you have been through this process, that this ain't my first rodeo, you do on that day what you can do that day. And then you put it aside. You go watch a movie. You do something else altogether. And you trust that when you come back to it the next day or in a couple of days or in a couple of hours, there will be something new. That your brain will, will come up with, with new things. It's almost like there is a part of you that knows the whole story. And the whole story is like a mammoth in the tar pit. You know, and you have to wait for bones to come bubbling up. Yeah, the whole thing is down there, but your unconscious isn't going to give it all to you at one time. So I did that, and over several days, it began to take shape, and you took a look at it, and, you know, we were slightly interested. <laughs> I, I, hey, I made a great suggestion in addition to that piece, by the way, that I think is going to help itself. What's that suggestion? Do you remember? Or can, can you can you say adding a daughter, oh. adding the adding teenage daughter? daughter. Right. Yes, and, adding, but, adding a daughter. Maybe. But let me I, let me. I want to talk about you for a moment, honey. Oh, okay. uh, let's let's talk about you because oh, when right. when someone says to Stephen Barnes, "Huh, can you come up any ideas for?" This is what happens in his head. Okay, so it's not just this past weekend. I mean, it's not just the because this was oh, two, this was the previous weekend. This past weekend, the agent said just sent just a nugget like, "Hey, the studio might be interested in having some people pitch on these topics. What do you think?" And you have proceeded to come up with such a fantastic idea. I can't never mind writing it. I can't wait to watch it and you know, writer's block, which is partially our topic today. It's like you have the opposite. It's like you, you can't stop writing. You'll work all the way through the weekend because for you, writing is fun. Coming up with ideas is fun. Well, it's huge. It's huge fun. It's a game, you know, because it's like putting together a Lego model or something like this. You know, I take the pieces that I know. And at this point, I can trust that I'm not going to come up with things that are wildly inappropriate. I actually come up with ideas that I think, oh, that's stupid. That won't work. That can never work. And I will come to you and say, listen, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not going to kick me out of bed if I say the wrong thing here. You know, I'll ask almost for permission to, to come up with an idea. And the truth is that the idea I came up with simply wasn't as wild as I thought it was. Right. That, the, that the idea actually did fit into that universe. So I, one of the things I know is that we, how do I put this, we question ourselves when we should trust ourselves. And that's probably one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later. Yeah, um, let's let's frame the, the conversation a little bit for the uh, viewers, because usually we have a guest. And after 10 minutes of, of 
banter and catching up, we introduce our guest. Today's guest is Writer's Block. We'll probably have Writer's Block on again, <laughs> but we're going to talk well, I about so. I mean, what it is, how, how you, what, first of all, what it is, is an important thing to understand. What it really is, not what you think it is, what it really is, is important to understand. And then, of course, strategies that we teach in our Life Writing Premium Program and to our students on what you do about it. So how, if, you know, if, if we look at this, and I said there was a pitch that I, that I sent in last Wednesday, and then there was another one that, uh, for a movie, that was for podcasters. Then there was one for a movie that was triggered by a list of, of movies that this particular studio was interested in remaking or getting takes on. And there was one in that list that interested me. And all I Both did of us, was, actually. I, yeah, that's right. We came up to, you know, we both were interested in that particular idea independently, mm -hmm. which told me, this, okay, this, this will be good. So then it's just a matter of writing down what I know. You know, I might, it might just be a series of questions. And over the days, it has started to develop. I'm, I'm not there yet, but I might be 50% of the way to a rough pitch. Yeah, oh, it is so, I'm like, forget this studio. We need to just write this script. Yeah, that's you probably going to end up being our, our, next, our next. Whether it's for them or not, it's just... So, so you know, writer's block yes what because how would you define writer's block and then we'll say what i how i define it and then we'll talk about it some more including possibly times when aspects of it have hit us in our career so how would you define it sweetie you know i used to think of writer's block primarily as a lack of research Mm -hmm. whether it's not knowing well, enough is that, is that that's not the definition of writer's block that's a definition that, no. is, that was your explanation for what creates writer's block well right well so how okay. would you define writer's block first what is it what is well, the thing? writer's block is just that feeling that you can't write you know some people experience it as a complete aversion to their keyboard <laughs> some people might put their project in front of them and literally not want to touch it or know how to touch it. I've been there. Or just the idea of working on it makes you feel sick to your stomach. <laughs> I think that's one version of it. Been there too. It's it's the opposite of flow state. It is the state where the spigot feels like it is turned off and you are a writer in name only because you're not writing. And, and I used to teach that I thought that feeling came primarily from uh, a lack of research, whether like with the historical, you literally don't know what the room looks like or how to furnish the room or how people would have looked in that, you know, or you don't know enough about the story. You haven't outlined it. So you don't, literally don't know what your character is supposed to do next and how that would create a sense of propulsion in the story. It's always a fear that what you write is going to suck. I think that's the bottom line. It's fear. Uh, it's not literally that your hands won't work and that your keyboard has stopped working. It's that you have lost your faith or you don't have enough faith in your ability to create good writing in that session. And that if you continue typing and if you create a bunch of bad writing, that somehow that is going to doom and curse you to a life of not being a writer and not being a real writer. And you will reveal yourself to yourself somehow, like, aha, I knew you sucked. I mean, it's just, it's all these emotions, right? It's all these, these emotions and all artists have to grapple with, with emotions. I can't imagine being an actor where you're, you're preoccupied with the way your nose looks, the way your chin, you know, that's your day. It's like worrying about your angles and how people are perceiving you and how you look. And it's so personal, but writer's block, listen, it's not a joke. It has crippled and devastated probably more not just careers, but endeavors for, for, for writers, then, then we can count. How many people have you met who say, I used to want to be a writer? Oh, I wanted to be a writer. As if somehow that, that magical time has passed and that you can't pick up writing at any point, which is one of the great things about writing. It's not like being an athlete. You can actually start writing whenever. You can, you can be on a sickbed and that's the day you start writing because now you finally have the time. You know what I mean? There, that you can be 80 years old and write your first short story. Writing is glorious in that way, but it also feels there's such a reverence that we have for it. Whether you've produced writing previously or you just enjoy good reading, you have such a reverence for it that the idea of raising your voice becomes toxic. And that is that feeling 
of writer's block and it is emotional and it is a lie and we are going to talk about how to murder writer's block in its sleep <laughs> in today's podcast murder i say murder all right murder most foul i would say the writer's block, you know if you take a look at the, the the six steps of the of the life writing process uh, to write a sentence a day write one to four short stories a month finish and, and submit those stories. Don't rewrite except to editorial request. Read 10 times as much as you write and can repeat this process 100 times. That's the, the six steps. Writer's block would be anything that interrupts that process. The, the most clear, the clearest definition or the, the most obvious thing is inability to write. Inability to, you know, you look at the screen, the empty page and you freeze. Uh, that's the thing that people experience most clearly but there's also going to be being unable to finish what you write you know it it just peters out or you lose enthusiasm or the inability to get yourself to polish what you've written you can't stand the look of it or the inability to send it out once oh, yeah. you finished it you know, afraid to I, show it to anybody i would say that the inability to to do your research, do your reading, so that your work continues to improve is also another form of block. But in, in general, the, the most, the clearest thing is you can't put words to paper, you know, or you can't put words on the screen. That would be the thing that people understand. And, and it, 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 that damages yourself. If you define yourself as a writer, what's clear is writers write. You know, authors have written. But writers write. Any day that you write, you're a writer. When you don't didn't write that day, that day you weren't a writer, and they they stack up. And you know, a lot of days where you're not a writer begins to wear at your self image. It begins to eat away at your ego, at your sense of, of who you are and what you're doing. So it can become extraordinarily insidious and extremely damaging. And if you're oh. trying to to generate, move yourself from one level of a career to another, and that's that's a core thing that Sonora Reeve and I are, are doing right now, you know, sorry, that you and I are doing right now, sweetie, is we're specifically looking to leverage ourselves from one point in our careers to a higher point. You know, you know, books and awards and made a lot of money and we've done television. I did a lot of television back in the day. We've done a little bit right now. We have all these things in development and there's all this interesting stuff. But what we're trying to do is to get solidly on that level. So the podcast in a lot of ways is documenting that process. What are or our thoughts, who are our allies, what what are the things that we need to do, what are our processes. So because frankly, we yeah. don't want you all to have to spend 15 or 20 years figuring this stuff out like like I did. That's right. We're trying to leave a trail of breadcrumbs so you all can come pick it right up. So everything we say like narrative podcasting is a real growth industry in storytelling and there is money behind it. You need to listen. Comics are becoming a way that a lot of writers are beginning to interact with story in a new way. And yeah, it's my a book that just came out 10 days ago. It was a graphic novel. If right. You, if you're watching this on video, the, the cover of the Eightfold Path, the book is right behind you. And it was another behind way you. of, huh? It's behind you. It, it's behind me. That's right. It's behind me. It, it's another way of getting the ideas out there. It's another way of experimenting, of growing, another way of expressing myself. And it's another way of touching the excited little kid part of me. I'd never done that before. I wrote, I wrote a Batman comic book. I created another comic book called Fusion. But a graphic novel is not something I've done. And I'm really interested in it. After reading The Watchmen, I realized, oh, a lot more can be done in the comic form than I thought, in the graphic form than I thought. Uh, I was late to the party in that sense, but I hadn't really done much in terms of comic since I had that revelation. So the Eightfold Path is a way of doing things. Podcasts would be a way of doing things. The, the conversational podcast like we have right now is an expression of creativity, but a narrative podcast would be a lot more along that line. It's like a movie, writing a movie. Then oh, I can really add my sound effect. My sound effects. That's right. <laughs> we've, talked, that. we've talked about that. You know, we've talked about there's a a, a movie that we want to do that yes. we're working with uh, with another friend to position ourselves to have that opportunity. There are these television series. There's this. There's that. And if okay. it is, if, if the truth is it the best way to have an idea, a good idea is to have a lot of bad ideas. Yeah, I was going to say all these things that you're talking about, whether it's yeah. comics or podcasts or film treatments or television treatments or books or short stories, they all rely upon your ability 
to create the pages. That's right. Because if you figure that 90% of what you write is crap and that what you're doing is you write and then you look for what is good in what you've written and you polish that and then you use that to springboard to other goodnesses. You know, I'm going to polish all my sentences until they come up to this level. And then something else looks the best. Ah, I'm going to polish until it comes up to that level. It, it is that evolutionary process of realizing that, you know, you keep digging through that pile of manure because you know there's a pony in there somewhere. You have to, you have to be willing to write millions of words to get the hundreds of thousands of words or the tens of thousands of words that really, really shine and sparkle. And that means that you cannot afford to be precious. You can't afford to labor over a sentence for weeks or months. You can't do that. You have to produce text and then polish that text and cut and polish and rearrange and let people look at it and look at the way it looks on the screen, look at the way it looks on the page and listen to the way it sounds when you read it out loud because every way you, you present it hits a different this, a different part of your brain, I think. So, yeah. so blocking, not being able to produce the pages is the fastest way to kill that entire process. The entire process grinds to a halt right there. So you yeah. have to be capable of solving that one. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I've noticed since we started this podcast and something I pay attention to when I'm talking to other authors who are having a good moment. Like I have a former student at Antioch who writes literary fiction and she is just a bright shining star right now. Everywhere I turn around, she's getting reviewed in all the major newspapers, she's getting toured. And for literary fiction, you know, sure. that's not always a given. That's usually more quiet storytelling and, and, and it takes a little bit more, I think, to get that, that publicity machine behind you. And then I ran into her at the Los Angeles Times Book Fair, got to talk about this great moment she's in. And she, this is a seven year process for her. It's not like she woke up at this point. <laughs> it was a, lo a laborious process in editing this book, getting it out. She, she said, basically, I worked my ass off, okay? And, and I think it's important for people to understand that when you're looking at all the successes, oh, they got their TV show on the air. Oh, they published their novel. What you're not seeing is those moments when they felt like they couldn't write those moments where they got stuck. I have a novel, I guess, coming out next year called The Reformatory that resonated with her process because it took me seven years to write that book. And it's not that I recommend it. And I never want to take that long to write a book again. There were a lot of other things happening, like co-raising our son and then learning screenwriting and getting my, my, my screenwriting credits along the way. But if I'm honest, the thing that really kept me away from writing most of the time was the emotional difficulty of that project. Mm -hmm. Talk it, about that a little bit. Well, it's set in 1950. Yeah. So already I'm like, mm, don't want to be here. <laughs> right. If I ever found a time machine, I can guarantee you I would be not setting it for 1950, unless it was to see a very specific jazz concert or something like that, but getting the hell out of there as soon as possible. But it's, it's about uh, a real life tragedy in my family history where a teenager named Robert Stevens died at the Mariana, the Dozier School for Boys in Mariana, Florida, where, where he was basically imprisoned. You know, it was a juvenile prison disguised kind of as a school, but it was also a work farm and all kinds of horrible things. And it has its own cemetery there as written about by Colson Whitehead in his book, The Nickel Boys, which predates mine by a couple of years, uh, longer and longer as time goes on. Uh, zeitgeist, you know, we, we both heard about this place uh, and wanted to write about it. And, I decided to use the supernatural to blunt some of the impact of the physical traumas being imposed on these children. And even so though, because our son Jason was about the, the, the age of the protagonist as all these years were going on, I just had a really tough time wanting to be in the world of that story. Now, ultimately I love the novel. I think it came out exactly as I hoped it would. You always hope that your your own issues with your writing are not going to be obvious to your readers. You know, once the novel comes out, they'll think, oh, she must have had a blast writing this, is what I would hope. But it wasn't a blast. It wasn't a blast. It reminds me of what Octavia Butler said about writing Kindred. She said it was a long, difficult write. And that's how this book felt. It was a long, difficult write. And yeah, so 
that was my version of writer's block. And I'm not just trying to show the course, but I do happen to be married to the creator of the life writing program. And our centerpiece is the sentence a day model. So during those moments where I couldn't even make myself outline the rest of this book, I would use the sentence a day to finish the outline. I would use the sentence a day to get past this chapter. And the, the secret, as you've probably learned by now, if you're using this method, is that it's very hard to write just one sentence. So you're probably going to write more, but some days you're not. Some days I'm perfectly happy just to say, okay, that was my sentence. And I'm keeping my contract with myself. But the, the, the reformatory was definitely a case where I felt writer's block more acutely than probably any other novel I've ever worked on because it was so personal, it was about a child, and it was in this really grim, dreary setting of a haunted reformatory. Okay. Well, from the outside looking at me, I knew that you were dealing with, I knew that you had your brakes on. I didn't know exactly why you had your brakes on, too, but I knew that you were allowing life to get in the way. So Absolutely. I was. remember asking you, when you wanted to have it finished by and then we actually created a graph how many pages per day would you have to do on average in order to meet the mark that you wanted you could set any mark that you wanted and then you'd be able to take a look did you or did you not do the work on that day and if you did great celebrate and if you didn't you could ask yourself why didn't i what well that was get in my way that was definitely one of the breakthroughs that happened during COVID and the COVID was helpful in the sense that I was afraid I was going to die because I'm a hypochondriac. So I couldn't bear the idea that I wouldn't finish this novel I had been working on for so long. So absolutely set up my page quotas, my chart where I could look at it every day. How many pages did I do a day? Honestly, two to three pages yeah. was not a bad clip for me with no, this not book. Bad. It's not a bad clip. One page will get a book a year done. Right. Uh, but there was also another breakthrough. And this is something I never really gave much credence to, because I've never been one of those writers who believed in pampering your muse. It's like, if I have a door that closes, I'm going to write behind it. Uh, if we were traveling, I would sometimes write in the bathroom in the early morning. You know, it's like I was never fancy about needing a place to write. But this was the one time I ever rented a cabin and went out to Idlewild and went by myself to this cabin where I reread Mother's the book. Day, wasn't it? I think it was Mother's Day. I reread what I had from beginning to end. I looked at my outline and I basically charted my path. Like, this is what I need to do to get this. It's, and it was before the page quotas. It was before COVID, maybe a year before. But it was really, really significant. And I walked away from that thinking, huh, maybe the change of scenery idea isn't so bad. It's not that you can afford to do that all the time. Some of you can't afford to do it at all. So that's where the Starbucks comes in, you know, with a headphone. A Starbucks and some headphones can definitely feel like enough of a change of scenery to get that jump start you're looking for. There's something about the sameness of the same space, the same, sorry, honey, the same people, you know, where it's just sometimes hard to, to feel that creative spark so writing in the backyard is something you might consider writing on your balcony just literally a change of scenery can help put you in a different mindset great yeah i remember i'm trying to think about the worst writer's block i ever had yeah i'd like to hear about it because it, i've never seen you have writer's block in 23 years it was probably when i was writing for television Those Twilight Zone. before episode, i met you which was called uh teacher's aid. It was about an inner city remedial English teacher who gets possessed by a demon and that actually helps her dealing with the gangs in the school. Mm -hmm. I was played by Adrienne Barbeau and I was, when I wrote the first draft, I was in a great space. I mean, this was my first writing for television. It was a wonderful opportunity. DC Fontana and Harlan Ellison were on staff for the, actually, I don't know if Dorothy was on staff. Dorothy was, was in that in that inner circle. Harlan was on staff. And I really wanted to be to make it good. And they loved my first draft. They loved it so much. Oh, and, that's so great. Yeah, they did. And it, they, basically, the way they had it set up was that they were going to do stories of many different lengths. They thought, you know, we might do 15 minutes, half hour, 45 minutes, an hour. We might do two hour stories, a three hour story split over several episodes. They, they didn't know what they wanted to do. They wanted to be very experimental. So my episode was 15 minutes long. That was the first draft I turned in them was 15 minutes long. And they loved it. And they said, can you make this longer? Can you make this a half hour episode? I couldn't do it. Oh, yeah. 
I froze. I was terrified. I would just, I just stared at the page and I could think of nothing. And I, I blew it. I think I managed to get it up to maybe, maybe it was 20 minutes, 25 minutes, maybe. I don't think so. And I remember ultimately I was not happy with that. And there were some things that happened with Uncle Harlan that I was not delighted about that I won't go into right now. I had the, my episode was back to back with one of his uh, called Paladin of the Lost Hour, which turned out to be the last acting that Danny Kaye ever did. And I, I just froze. And the reason I froze was fear. Yes. Now, what was the fear? Can I stop you there? Because they loved, could, couldn't do it. They loved I your could. first draft. I mean, look, the part of us that writes is not the same as the part of us that edits mm. or starts thinking about dreaming up ideas. What Stephen King refers to as the boys in the basement, the, the part of you that does the real writing, the deep writing, is not the I. It's not the part of you that, that it's not the part of me that says, my name is Stephen Barnes. It's something else. Maybe it's little Stevie, but they were asking little Steve's dad oh, to yeah. expand little Stevie's, you know, homework and his dad couldn't do it. So it, it was, they were talking to the wrong part of me. They, the kid part of me was not coming out to play. It's like, you know, oh, well, these are, th these are big adults and they want me to, I mean, I don't know what, how it, that part of me would describe its, its interrupted process. But I do know that there was fear around that because just because that part of me could do it at one point doesn't mean I could do it then. This was my first rodeo, remember? Yeah, and I have to say, audience, I don't know if you even understand how extraordinary it was that Steve was even writing a Twilight Zone episode back during that 80s run when you could count the number of Black screenwriters, you know, maybe not on one hand or two hands, but there were not that many working black television writers, no, especially in genre. Come on. As a science fiction writer, I, that was still within that period where Octavia and I knew of none, no others besides myself, you know, and, and, and her. So it, it, it hit every insecurity I had and it was devastating. And it took years to overcome that. I had to come up with a clear definition for myself of, you know, what writer's block is, is easy to define. You can't write. But what is it that causes it? I had to come up with a specific answer, something that, you know, you have to define your problem in solvable terms. That's one of the secrets to success in life. So if I have writer's block, what is writer's block? The definition that I came up with is has been very useful to me. Writer's block, in the way that I discuss it in life writing, www.lifewritingpremium.com. Right. Writer's block is a confusion of two separate states. The, the editor state, no, the flow state first, where you are creating the text, and the editing state where you judge and polish the text. Those are two different hats you're wearing, two different parts of your brain. And the problem is that the editor part of you is older, more educated, more mature, and more painstaking than the flow part of you. The flow part of you is just like a big kid or like a little kid. The editor part can always point out mistakes that that kid made. You know, it, if you suspended the, the editor, if you did not judge what you were writing, you'd be capable of sitting there and typing all day long. I mean, if you're, if, if you're not editing, you're not worried about spelling, grammar, structure, any of those things. So to me, that's what's going on. You are, the editor part of you is judging what you're writing while you are writing it rather than waiting until after you have written it, maybe the next day. I mean, so my general process is one day I'll plan what I'm going to write. I'll plan out a story. You know, I might do that for several days. When I'm ready to start writing it, I will write five pages a day. But I will have no concern whatsoever for spelling or grammar or anything else. It's just fill up the page. It is complete separation of the flow and the editing modes. Now, and then on the next day, I might go in there and edit it, okay? And then the next day I'll polish it, or I might edit one story in the morning and flow on another story in the afternoon or vice versa. The point being, 
But once you define it that way, you get can get some leverage because whereas everybody knows, you know, you can take any master's and MFA program in the country and attend any writer's workshop and they will give you all sorts of tools for editing. Okay, there's you know tons of editing, and you can take classes in grammar, and classes in in, in structure, in composition, and you can take classes in literature, and so in you screenwriting can, you can take classes in structure, not so much in MFA right. programs. But what but what these programs do not do is teach you how to flow. Mm. They don't teach you how to deal with the emotions that interrupt your flow. For instance, fear. Big one. So you know, big what, one. But the discipline of if, if the discipline of writing is a matter of these two things flow and editing coming together then if you separate them out you take your classes and editing and literature and stuff like that on the one hand but then you put on your other cap and you say how do i learn to flow how do i learn how to turn off the judgment first of all what is flow flow state is that moment where it feels that time has gone away oh my gosh it's that that it's falling in love with writing as a child which is what i did you know where you could scribble in a notebook and make up stories and adventures where you not only escape but you like you said time has melted where did the day go the trick is that that is the writing application of flow but flow also exists in countless of other domin dominions. It's not specific to writing any more than you know water is specific to the shape of the glass you pour it into. The water exists separate from the glass. I can pour it into the structure called writing and it functions beautifully there. But you can also find flow when you're dancing. And you music, I have my piano behind me, absolutely. Or listening to music. Dancing. Right? Oof driving on the freeway and you're listening to something music on the radio or something and you just suddenly notice that the eight miles have gone by you know mm. you were driving safely you're driving securely you turned all that over to unconscious competence but the time was zipping past he, frankly you know the last few seconds before you reach an orgasm sexually you're going into flow state it's the dissolution yeah. everything is dissolving the beast with two backs right you everything is dissolving it's the dissolution of the subject object relationship you fall through the page you fall through the painting you enter the danger zone where the dancer becomes the dance as they said in flash dance that this this thing and there was a, a psychologist, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, I believe his name is. He actually teaches over in Claremont, right, right next, to, right near where we live. Who wrote a book? Who, who first wrote the wrote the book that popularized the term flow? So what you can do is you do your study separately, and you research flow, and you ask yourself. Where do I experience flow in my life? Maybe the last few minutes before you go to sleep or the first minute when you wake up in the morning, the, the hypnagogic state is what they call it. Maybe when you go into uh, self-hypnosis or you have somebody hypnotize you or you're soaking in a hot tub. Or you're, or you're playing with your child. That's right. And, and, or, or, or your dog or your cat. And time just disappears and you're just floating away. You look for that and you kind of ask your unconscious mind, to identify those moments for you. When was I going into flow during this day, during this week? When and when you start identifying it, you kind of say to yourself, I want more of that. Mm. I want, you know, how did I breathe? What was my posture? What was I doing, thinking, feeling when I slipped into that state? Because that state dissolves stress. It is, you're in the moment. Let's see, what's another thing that is known about it? It You're doing something that is engaging, but not so challenging that you're worried about it. In other words, there's a, there's a, there's a, a range. Below a certain level of, of stress, you're not engaged, and so you're not in flow. You're just in boredom. Above a certain level, you are too stressed, and so you're breaking down because you're kind of panicking about it. But there is a point where you are intensely engaged, but also relaxed. That sweet spot. You it's know, sweet spot. even That's if right. you've even if you've veered over to anxiety, 
you could have uh, a rule or a ritual. Okay, well, I still have to write my sentence and you can make yourself write a sentence right. even, you even if out. you're even in a state of anxiety. But the best thing obviously would be to learn how to harness flow, which is what Steve is talking about. So that when you set out to write your sentence before you know it, it has become three pages. <laughs> that so, way that you're like, what? Yes, I rock. I and suggest, no, yeah, go, go ahead and finish me. No, you go, you go. I would suggest that you choose three different things to experiment with. In other words, you go, you use the Google and you look up flow state and you find activities that are known to trigger flow state or engage flow state. In my life, there are probably a half dozen different things that I do deliberately to learn how to go into flow state. Tai Chi goes into flow state. Yoga goes into flow state. Meditation goes into flow state. This is a big one for me. And also we learned about Octavia when we went to see her in 2000 for that interview for the podcast that we did a couple weeks ago where we played that recording. She, she was blasting music, blasting music. And music is a huge flow creator yes, for me. Is. Music is like, I, I've had books where I created entire soundtracks for them. So that if I put on that soundtrack, I was in the world of that book and I could see those characters and it, or sometimes it's just a kind of music, jazz. Some writers have trouble writing to lyrics. T I don't listen to lyrics, but some people are really preoccupied with lyrics. So the kind of music that typically is considered to be the best would be either soft jazz or Vivaldi you know 60 minute largo rhythm string music no vocalizations will drop you into trance you or frankly techno boom 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 that would i mean it's complete polar opposite you're what dancing, you're talking about or just listening to it no just listening to it for me i'm just really? saying for me personally well, the, just the, the a driving beats horror soundtracks you know if i'm writing horror to put me in that mood yes I really do think that for people with busy lives and most of us have to section off our day. So like, let's say you have between this time and this time to write, even if it's just 20 minutes or half an hour, put on that music, that jump starts flow for some I, people. I remember, I remember when I first started working with Larry Niven, I was shocked to see how fast he could go into flow. He could just sit down and boom, he was there. The hardest flow, the person I, I knew who could go into, into flow the deepest was Harlan. Mm. You know, he could go in the flow so deep that he could sit in a store window or sit in the middle of a hotel lobby and write, you know, with mm. people standing all around him watching and he was just gone in the store. Uh, but if you couldn't find be me, a, <laughs> find a physical activity, you know, dance, you know, yoga, Tai Chi, you know, pranayama, breathing exercise, a mental activity like sitting quietly and listening to your heartbeat or following your breathing. And the breathing, I want to, I've said this before, but I find it very, very effective. So I want to say it again, inhaling from the diaphragm for a count of four, holding it for four, exhaling slowly through the mouth for a count of eight. That helps me go to sleep at night. And I bet you that will help you beat off those voices of anxiety that are causing writer's block. It definitely can. Meditation of many different kinds. If you decide, if you discover that what stops you from being able to go into a flow state, which then stops you from writing and progressing your career, is let's say it's uh, it's fear. Fear of success, fear of failure, you know, fear that your finished work is not going to live up to your dream of the way it sounded in your head, you know. This is a good time for journaling. This is a mm. good time for meditation, for therapy, for any number of different things to help you you know, because one of the reasons why we do that you know, one sentence a day thing, you know, it's like, you know, we, the title of life writing of, of, of our podcast could have been write a book a year with a sentence a day. And anybody who can do math knows that that would imply a, a book that's 365 sentences long. No, because we didn't say it was only a, one sentence a day. We just said, if you'll promise to write a sentence a day, that we can get you there because of what Tanana Reeve implied earlier. Once you've written that sentence, you're going to write more. Right. You know? And so if, if you tell yourself, I have to write three pages to stay on track, if you genuinely are busy that day, you may not have time to write three pages. The trick is that we can make ourselves so busy you don't have time to write three pages. You can Say that barely, again. Say that again. You can make yourself so hey. busy that you don't have the time available to write three pages. But yeah, we're talking always, to you always have time 
to write one sentence. Yes. And if you take the time to write sen one sentence, you will usually, not always, but usually discover you actually had more time than that. You had time to write a paragraph or half a page or a page because what was stopping you was not the lack of time. It was, what was stopping you was fear. The, right. the fear that you could not or should not was stopping you from doing the thing. And if you do the thing, you're going to start getting better. Assuming that you have encoded within you the belief that if you keep doing something and studying that thing, you're going to get better at that thing. It's just one of the most useful beliefs a human being can have that you're capable of learning. So and what I'm going to ask people to do is, is to experiment with my definition that, that, that writer's block is a confusion of the states of flow and editing. Separate those two out. If you have to flow at your desk, you know, flow out in the yard on a piece of paper and, and then edit at your desk or wear two separate hats or have two separate desks or work in two separate rooms. If fool you yourself. Fool yourself. What kind of music do you need? What kind of light do you need in the room? You know, what do you need to have your shoulders rubbed? Do you need to do a little yoga first? What do you need to do in order to get into the place where you are relaxed enough? I mean, I don't want to make too fine a point of it, but sometimes a glass of wine for some people or an edible. I'm not saying to write while you're drunk, you know, <laughs> but for some people, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a twist there in your head. Not every time. I'm just now, saying. I'm going to say that I, I do not agree with that. Okay. I think that that's a bad idea. We can. My attitude is that that anything that a drug can do for you, you can do for yourself. And I have known too many people who became dependent on substances. Of one oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, I, I and, hesitated to bring it up because yeah, I am, I'm not talking about dependency. And, you not, know. Nobody ever plans to become dependent. Right. And I'm not saying that everybody will. And there are writers more successful than I am you know, who do have that glass of wine, that, that can of beer, you know, that do smoke that doob or whatever before they start writing. And they, they are fine. They have their careers. I'm simply saying that I would never make that suggestion for the reasons, the reasons. Yeah, why. it's it's, it, a, it's a slippery slope. And it's, it, uh, you know, I knew in all seriousness, I, I bought a keyboard mm -hmm. from a musician once who told me he could only make music when he was high. And that is like, whoa, that is not where you're headed or want to be headed or at all. All that means is that about. he has never learned, you know, a drug, no drug, drugs don't create an effect that your brain can't create for itself. Drugs work because you have receptors, you know, for for the the, the molecule in THC or, al or if alcohol is changing your blood or is doing that. Your brain can do that for itself if you train it. So the one thing I would say concerning substances of various kinds is that when you're finished writing, that to, to engage in those activities is an adult choice. But you can actually make it work to your advantage if you, say, if you have a couple drinks or smoke a doob or whatever it is, and you think, now nah, I'm right in the I'm right in the headspace that I want to be at. To ask yourself, what do I need to do to get to that headspace without the drug? And also, what will the huh? writing be as good? <laughs> you know, that's always that question. Will will the writing be as good? But well, yeah, it, it can, it can. No, really, I'm not I'm not denying that there are incredibly prolific and accomplished writers who, you know, you know, Samuel Coleridge, you know, it's just, you know, wrote Xana, you know, in, in, in Xanadu to Kubla Khan, a, a stately pleasure dome decree when he was on absinthe or laudanum or something like that. I mean, it's not that it can't work. It's that you also, you remember that writer I introduced you to who at one point had been one of the great short story writers. Oh the, yeah, no, I'm haunted no, by that meeting. No longer able to write because he had damaged himself with drugs mm. enough that at every, you know, one of the aspects of creativity is to run into a problem and then say, okay, this is a situation here, come up with three possible solutions. And then you choose the best of those solutions and you head off in that direction. At every sentence, he would see the multiverse of literary yes. possibilities and could not decide between them. So if he had an editor telling him 
what to write, he could do it. He could do it just fine. But he had crippled his executive function. Right. So he and couldn't differentiate that between these. Part of that. Yeah. I know other writers. One of the writers, one of the, the, the great writers of the original Twilight Zone had a problem. He, he liked Pac too much. And he actually got to the point where he was not writing. He would teach other people how to write. He'd talk about his projects, but he couldn't finish them. And there are people, there are countless people run into that with alcohol and other things. And yet, and still, I'm not saying that these things can't be entertainment. No, I get what you're saying. There are probably people listening who are like, oh, you know, I have a a glass of wine, you know, before I sit at my computer, it's fine. And and it's probably fine for you. But Steve's larger point is that there are ways you can train your mind to get to that place without the wine. And that for some people, not necessarily you, that wine is a slippery slope that actually will hurt your process rather than help it. Any piece of advice I give people, I have to ask myself, what happens if they take it? Yeah, true. Would, if they take this piece of advice, how likely am I to see that person in five years and they say, I took your advice, Steve, this is the result. I would hope that if they take my advice, their results will be at least neutral, didn't work, or positive. It worked great. And so far, in, in most of the advice I've given, that has been the result. If people took it, it worked out well. Okay, and it only didn't work out well if they didn't take it. You know? Right. You don't want but, someone but to say, yeah, one. I took it and I took it and I took it and I took it. <laughs> right. You know, I took it and took it. Yeah, I don't want to go down that road. I, right. I, I don't feel, I I would not feel like a responsible teacher. No, that's great. I and and I, I and thank you for that. I, I'm not going to edit it out because I think it is a valid conversation and it's one that we're not the first, you know, to have this conversation and, and writers are thinking it. So we might as well say it. But I, I want to say a, a special aside to my writers out there who are transitioning into television. And, and I'll be talking to myself in part with this advice, because as horrifying as it can be to face the empty page when it's just your contract with yourself, because you said you want to write this thing. This is your story. This is your you've been carrying this around for years. You finally want to get it out. That, that can be terrifying by itself. As a prose writer dealing with one editor who makes suggestions or one agent who makes suggestions is another kind of terror sometimes. Now you've got this new voice in your head. Are they right? Are they wrong? I've had editors make suggestions I didn't agree with, you know, that I went ahead and executed and it worked out okay, right? It's like, uh, so I'll consider it neutral. Not, not, not necessarily better, but not worse, right? I, I listen. But when you're, when you're writing television and film, now you have a committee in your head. You have the committee that is sometimes, as in our case, your collaborator, Steve and I work together. You have executives who were at that last meeting where you all discussed this idea. You have the executives who are on the uh, studio side who are going to also read and hear that idea. And at some point, you're going to be doing what Steve was doing, which is revising that script or trying to when you have all these different fears, your personal fears, am I good enough? Am I understanding the things that people are saying I should do? Do I agree with the things? Can I get my heart behind it? How can I, how can I take something that now feels like a, a chemistry table and turn it back into flow and fun? <laughs> and I think that's kind of where I am with this particular pitch. I want to get back to some damn flow and some damn fun. So what I'm going to do is the next time I sit down to write probably tonight, at least my sentence, I am going to turn off or at least try to turn off all those other voices and hear deep inside what is my voice saying, where is the fun, where is as I, my inner child, as I call her little T, what is she trying to say? Because here's the truth. Yes, sometimes you have to do what the gatekeepers say. And little T is a good girl. Yes. It some deserves t- to have a good time. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Sometimes and, a rather bad girl, you know what I mean? And I think all right, too. now, honey. We don't need to get into all that. <laughs> but so, but uh, you have to, it, it just becomes more and more important as you aspire to uh, work in an industry that so many people are trying to get into that is so competitive. Yeah. It's even more Probably important to learn. the most competitive writing game in the world. Yeah, it's even more important to learn how to regulate that fear up and down, regulate those voices until you can barely hear them, enough so that you're doing what you were asked to do, but enough that you can just float on your back in a swimming pool 
and feel your way through this story because it's your story they're all talking about. It's your story they all love. You're in charge of this story. It might not feel like it, but you're in charge of the story. So take it, take it. One of the things that is true is that we talk about the Life Writing Premium program on this. And one of the things that I'm proud about that program is that it offers the same definitions of what writer's block is, shows why it will kill your career, but it also offers a couple of, you know, several specific techniques and tools. You know, there is specifically a guided meditation, the ancient child, that is designed to place you in flow state. So if you will use this, you'll start noticing that sort of lazy dream state that it puts you in and you can let your subconscious begin to recognize that. And what I suggest you do is you stack those moments and you you follow the program and you it would have been it'd be irresponsible to have a program that did not have the the psychological and emotional tools that enable you to to use it because that's what stops most people not the lack of understanding but the fear you know yes. i just talk to people they just they're just terrified it's like they, they have a a whole house full of half finished stories because they're terrified to actually finish one so I strongly suggest, please, we're offering every resource that we know how because we really want you to win this. We really want, if you want to follow the path that we're talking about here to New York publishing or Hollywood, you know, television film, um, join, you know, go to lifewritingpremium.com and check out what it is that we have there for you. Because I can absolutely guarantee you that everything in that course, it's a 52 week exploration all you have to commit to is if you can write one sentence a day and watch one short video a week we can get you there because we can we can talk to you directly and indirectly and give you the tools and you'll start realizing that as long as you're doing your sense a day there's no guilt so you so the, the 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 dark part of your ego can't beat you over the head for not doing your work because you're doing your page you're doing a sentence a day yes then you are you can have the fun of saying well maybe i'd like to do some more but there's no you're not getting beat up no shame i mean there's my no gosh shame about it no guilt about it that's you know we why do we do that to ourselves writers why do well, we take something that's already so difficult and, and feels like it's exposing us so much and make it more difficult with self-recrimination and, and hating ourselves and shame. It's just let all that go, breathe it out, breathe it out and, and write your sentence and just show yourself that you're a writer. Well, join us, you know, we'll, if you sign up, you know, soon you can actually get a story into the next life writing hot seat we'll be doing we'll be doing one you know early in may and we want you to participate we want to have a chance to show you what it is that you have inside yourself that would enable you to give that gift to the world absolutely you yeah you, you have those gifts just like tonari when you were a little girl you believed in yourself i believed in myself and we fought our way to you know building a career that made us happy yes you just want to share that stuff we want everyone to have that so check out lifewritingpremium.com be sure to go back and listen to the older podcast if you missed nalo hopkinson was on last week the interview we did or actually sort of a mock interview with a recording from octavia butler the week before that brian fuller nk jemison please review us too i just realized today we're on audible our podcast is on audible our podcast is on apple podcasts Please leave your reviews and let other people know uh, that you enjoy this podcast. I've had people DM me privately and say, oh, this has been such a help. If you could just make that public and help get the word out, more writers can discover this podcast and get the help they need to. Excellent. Well, I guess let's wrap this up. You know, just letting people know that we believe in your ability to take your dreams out of your heart and give them to the world. It's as simple as that. That's right. And by having the courage to write, even when you're afraid and learning how to get into flow so you won't be afraid will help make you the hero or heroine of your own story. Take care and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.